we know that your diet is often at the root of these autoimmune issues. But the authors of this article have to give another caveat. However, this is not so much because of the meat, as meat can be pro-inflammatory. Well, that's a, that's a false statement. There is no good evidence for that. Uh, and I've talked about that in the past. But mainly because this diet can reduce inflammation via various other mechanisms. For example, when following high animal protein diets, people often substantially reduce their intake of pro-inflammatory sugars and refined carbs. Well, yeah, I would agree with that. By consuming less sugary and starchy foods like bread, pasta, potatoes, and rice, which authors here also recommend. So I'm on the same page with them here. Uh, I don't worry about sugar in the form of fruit, honey, maple syrup, or milk, but I think that starchy foods like bread, potatoes, pasta, rice are a problem for humans for a variety of reasons, not least of which is gut inflammation leading to endotoxin and all of the downstream effects of that, as I've talked about in the past with Georgie Dinkov. Meat-based eaters, they say in this article, may also eat less junk food, more vegetables, well, not on a carnivore diet, and consume more healthy anti-inflammatory fats. Well, possibly, except if they're doing most of these diets, they're not consuming polyunsaturated fats, they're consuming saturated fats, which are the true anti-inflammatory fats. They continue, while consuming fewer substances that can cause autoimmune diseases like gluten, soy, or dairy. I think raw dairy is not gonna cause any autoimmune issues, and I will do a little segment to this podcast about the benefits of dairy in a moment. So in a certain way, a carnivore diet is also a restriction diet. Well, I would agree with that, and so is an animal-based diet. However, given meat and various fats in meat can also induce inflammation, reducing meat intake combined with low glycemic vegetables, legumes, mushrooms, and healthy fats would be even more beneficial. That is where I disagree with them. Meat and various fats in meat do not induce inflammation, and the references they provide to substantiate that claim are pretty bogus. This is the first article <laughs> They use to support the claim that meat is inflammatory, which is a, uh, a follow-up on the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer Evaluation in 2015. And in this article, they are going to use a lot of hypothesis to say that things like N-nitroso compounds, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and heterocyclic amines are harmful for humans. Well, if that's the case, then why did our ancestors thrive? And if you believe that our ancestors died early, you have some research to do. <laughs> And you need to understand that infant mortality confounds estimates of life expectancy. So why do the Hadza not have any real evidence of chronic disease, obesity, diabetes, or autoimmunity, or cancer when all of these things are so harmful in meat? We can make the argument in a lot of ways. The other reference they use is alterations of host gut microbiome interactions in multiple sclerosis, which isn't really about their purported statement anyway. <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure how they hope to substantiate the claim that red meat is so inflammatory here. And if you are concerned about red meat and cancer and mechanisms, please refer to this excellent paper that I've spoken about in the past. The title is Red Meat and Colon Cancer, a review of the mechanistic evidence for heme in the context of risk assessment methodology. And the takeaway here is that there is just not enough good evidence to say that N-nitroso compounds polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or heterocyclic amines are actually that harmful for humans in reasonable doses that you would get by eating meat twice a day. Uh, unless you are eating the most burned, charred, fried meat on the planet, there's really no good evidence that these things are harmful for humans at all. So I will read from the abstract for a moment so you get the idea here. They say that in order to make claims that polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines are harmful for humans, and now I'm quoting, the evidence from in vitro studies utilize conditions that are not necessarily relevant for normal dietary intake and thus do not provide sufficient evidence that heme exposure from typical red meat consumption would increase the risk of colon cancer. What they're saying is that when you're doing experiments in test tubes, they're often using doses that are orders of magnitude higher than what you would get by eating a hamburger or a steak for dinner. They go on to say, animal studies utilize models that tested promotion of precancerous preneoplastic conditions utilizing diets low in calcium. This is a common trick or a common problem with animal research on heme, heme iron, or any of these compounds from meat in animal models and cancer. They put the animals on a low calcium diet, which we know is pro-cancerous. And when they give the animals enough calcium, they don't get cancer from heme or heme iron. Imagine that. I've talked about the importance of dairy many times and the importance of calcium in the human diet. So make sure you're getting calcium from raw dairy, from microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, bone meal, things like that, et cetera. I'll continue on the abstract. 
Um, these diets were high in fat and combined with exaggeration of heme responses that in many instances represented intakes that were orders of magnitude above normal dietary composition, that were orders of magnitude above normal, normal dietary consumption of red meat. We're back to the same thing. Final, finally, clinical evidence suggests that the type of and nitroso compounds, again, I told you guys this is going to get complex in this podcast, formed after ingestion of red meat in humans consists mainly of nitrosyl iron and nitrosyl thiols, products that have profoundly different chemistries from certain N nitroso species, which have been shown to be tumorogenic, promoting cancer, uh, through the formation of DNA adducts. In conclusion, the methodologies employed in current studies of heme have not provided sufficient documentation that the mechanism studied would contribute to an increased risk of promotion of precancer or colon cancer at usual dietary intakes of red meat in the context of a normal diet. So you guys can read the paper if you want, but I think those authors have hit the nail on the head. And the problem here is that most of now this plant-based vegan longevity argument against meat rests on those tenants that we have shown to be very very shakier. And I'm talking shakier than a foundation built of sand at the Outer Banks when there's a hurricane coming. Shakier than a bamboo supported house when a tsunami is rolling into the shore. Very, very shaky. This is a house of cards. So the other thing I think it's important to consider now is what happens when you adhere to many of these low animal protein recommendations by eating a plant-based or a vegan or a vegetarian diet. Well, there's really good evidence that when you reduce animal protein and replace it with plant protein, you become more frail. So how is frailty going to get you longevity? I don't know. I don't understand these arguments in the first place, but I'll show you studies to support that claim. We can start with this one, which is titled Partial Replacement of Animal Proteins with Plant Proteins for 12 Weeks Accelerates Bone Turnover Among Healthy Adults, a randomized clinical trial. You guys get the idea. More plant protein, less animal protein, more fractures. But proponents would want you to believe this is longevity, guys. I don't even know what's going on here. How about this one? Comparative fracture risk in vegetarians and non-vegetarians in Epic Oxford. This is an epidemiology study, but they looked at people who reported vegetarian or vegan diets, and they looked to see how often their bones broke. Well, wouldn't you know it? <laughs> um, in this population, fracture risk was similar among meat eaters, fish eaters, and vegetarian. The fracture risk is in vegans is higher and appeared to be a consequence of their considerably lower mean calcium intake. Well, it's probably also a consequence of their mean utilizable protein intake, their lower creatine intake. There are so many factors beyond calcium that could lead to an increased fracture rate. But it's basically undeniable to suggest that if you get rid of enough animal protein to a vegan level, you are going to be frail. You're going to have increased rates of fractures. In the first study, even getting rid of some of the animal protein led to it, as you might in a vegetarian diet. In Epic Oxford, it was the vegans who had an increased rate of fractures. But this is the first takeaway from this podcast, guys. Frailty is not longevity. <laughs> and look at the vegans you know and ask yourself, do they look frail or do they look strong? I'm not going to answer it for you. I'm just going to ask you the question and you can decide for yourself. 